First, let me say what a privilege it is for me to be here, uh, particularly in our situation. Um, it seems that uh, God has made it in such a way that our, our two churches are working together uh, very closely in so many different ways. And I think that is so encouraging to me, uh, particularly in this environment where a lot of times it seems like churches are more uh, in competition with each other than working together for the progression of the gospel. And I really do hope that uh, our two churches and maybe more churches in the future can set the example that churches are not fighting against each other. It's not about the number of people who gather at your church. It's about the faithful proclamation of the gospel. And as long as the different churches are doing such, then we should always hold hands together. We should always work towards the prog uh, progress of the kingdom. If your church grows, it is the kingdom of God which grows. It is the people of the gospel who flourish. And uh, I really do hope that we can continue to do this. And as uh, Sam mentioned, uh, we do have the, the advantage of uh, going together in missions. We went last year uh, to Arizona, and uh, we're going again this year, and uh, we've participated in other ways, so I hope that this continues. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me open us in prayer. I always feel better praying, and I think we can never have too much prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for this opportunity, the privilege of gathering together to worship you, Lord God. We know that there is nothing in and of ourselves that would be worthy of lifting up before your presence. We know that we are not people of clean hands and pure hearts that we can enter into your very throne room. And yet it is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we can. It is by his perfect blood that our imperfect selves, Lord, can be acceptable in your presence. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as we have gathered here together, as we have read scripture together, as we have sung songs together, as we have lifted up our voices, our hearts, Lord, together, as we have confessed our sins together, as we have confessed our faith together, as we hear the proclamation of your word together, that all of these things, Lord, may not only encourage each other, but may show to a world that does not understand the unity we have in you, the power that you give to us. And Lord, may it be a foretaste of our glorious celebration in heaven. And may we truly enjoy this time. Lord, come in the midst of us. Speak to us, Lord. Change us. Never allow us to remain the way that we are. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Never mind, my phone is frozen. So about two years ago, we were on the market to purchase a home. And I am not very good with finances. I'm not very good with economics. But I learned uh, while we were searching for a home, this simple fact. There's a difference between a seller's market and a buyer's market. A seller's market happens when there are more people who want to buy homes than there are who want to sell homes. And so they call it a seller's market because it's to the seller's advantage. Because more people want to buy, they can sell their home at a higher price. And then a buyer's market is the opposite of that, right? When more people want to sell their homes than people who want to buy. And that simple illustration shows us a law of economics called the law of supply and demand. And I know I'm horribly oversimplifying it, and for those of you who are in finance or economics or other things, you're probably laughing at me, grinning, and telling me how foolish I am to talk about the simplicity of the law of supp uh, supply and demand. But as simple as I can place it, the greater the supply, the less the price, right? The more of it you have available, the harder it is to sell. The less demand, the less the price as well. 
And then the opposite of that is the less supply, the greater the price, the greater the demand, the greater the price. So the highest priced items are those things that which are rare. You don't have a lot of it, but there's a high demand for it. A lot of people want it. And so they fight over it and the price goes up. And then the lowest price items are those things which there are a lot of, and people just don't really need it. One way to think of it, or one example of such, would be like trying to sell ice cubes in Alaska. Right? It's really cold there. It's in the middle of the winter. If somebody wanted ice, all they have to do is open their front door, walk outside with a cup, and scoop some up. Imagine trying to go to Alaska and trying to sell cubes of ice to them. They'd turn around and be like, what are you doing? We have no need for this, but for those of us who are going to Arizona, imagine trying to sell ice cubes to those who are living in Arizona in the middle of summer, where it will hit anywhere between 105 to 115, perhaps 120 if we're really unlucky. There are zero natural occurrences of ice in that weather. Zero. As a matter of fact, whatever ice you have will probably be gone within seconds. It is my hometown, and yes, I lived through 122.3 degrees. We, my friends and I, went outside and went to the asphalt, and we decided to test it. We took a raw egg, we cracked it upon the asphalt, and watched as it slowly cooked. That is our brains. So we have a lot to look forward to, but you could sell ice cubes so easily in Arizona because the demand is so high and the supply is zero. Simple concept for us to understand, the law of supply and demand. So what does that have to do with our passage today? Actually, I skipped something, didn't I? I just realized. I was supposed to read the scripture to you. Forgive me, um, my brain is not exactly operating right now. I just came back from Haiti, uh, where uh, it was extremely hot there to a completely different kind of hot. But let me read the passage to you now. Our passage comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Is it up on the board? It is. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. So, what does the law of supply and demand have to do with, uh, um, with our passage today? Well, simply put, Jesus gives an evaluation of the economics of missions, right? <coughs> Uh, with all these were supposed to be. <laughs> that would have been really nice, right? When I'm talking about law and supply, ice in the desert. I was wondering why none of the slides were coming up, but I guess that's, that's my fault. Good thing we believe in a gracious God. Uh, what does that have to do with, with our passage today? Because Jesus gives us his evaluation of the marketplace of missions, of the economics of missions, right? And it's important for us to understand what that is. And in order to set up this story, Jesus uh, first spoke about his ministry back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, right after he had finished his temptations in the desert and he starts his ministry. And the scripture tells us that what he did was he went out all throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. That's Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And then chapters 5 through 9 basically tell us all of these things that he did. He taught in their synagogues. He proclaimed the gospel message. He healed every form of disease. And then at chapter 9, after having spent all that time doing that, 
He evaluates what had happened because it introduces us to that same statement. Again, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And after, done, after having done all of that, what is his evaluation? What does he say about the ministry that he had done? He takes a look at all the people who are still coming to him, all the people who still so desperately need his healing, his teaching, people who have desperate questions to ask, and he responds with compassion. And this compassion drives him to make this observation, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. When we first hear this statement, it seems to be saying that the harvest is the supply. There's a great supply of harvest available to us. But is that really what's going on? It would be a very optimistic view. It'd be a positive view of the status of missions, of the status of the ministry of teaching and preaching and healing. But if we think about it, what is he comparing the harvest to? He's comparing the harvest to those people who came to him, those people who were destitute and lost those people who were poor, those people who had diseases of every kind who came to him to be healed, those people who had been abandoned by their societies, who had questions that were left unanswered in their current religious systems. If these are the people that are being compared to the harvest, can we genuinely say that what Jesus is saying is that the harvest is plentiful, the harvest which is ready to be reaped, the harvest which is ripe. Or is Jesus highlighting instead that there is a great need, a great demand for the gospel message to go out, that this is yet fruit which has not ripened. I would say, with the way that Jesus sets up this statement, that the harvest he's referring to is not the supply, but actually the demand. The demand for the ministry which Jesus was involved in. And if the first statement is the demand, then the second statement highlights the supply. There is a great demand for the gospel message to be proclaimed, and yet there is a small supply of those who are willing to work. While I was still dating my now wife, we had the opportunity to go out to a watermelon patch uh, at the watermelon patch, instead of buying watermelons at a market, you go to the actual farm. You, they give you a little basket or a wagon, and you drag that behind you, and you go back and forth among the patches, and you find the watermelon that you like. And then you can pick it right off of the patch and put it into your wagon. You take it back, they weigh it, and you pay the price, and you leave. But we came kind of late in the season, and I remember going back and forth and seeing so many of the watermelons that had not been picked and the time had passed and the watermelons had burst open because they'd overripened. Because the time for perfect picking had passed, no one had picked them. And the image that Jesus Christ is presenting to his disciples here is this image the image of so much harvest that was available to be picked and yet not enough workers to go out and pick it. And what would be the eventual uh, destiny of this harvest if left on their own? The harvest that is left on the stock would overripen, would burst, and would be wasted. 
Now, some of you at this point might object. Some of you who've uh, read your Calvin's Institutes or memorized your Westminster Confessions of Faith might turn around and say, well, we are a Reformed church. We believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe that only those whom God chooses are saved. And any who are left on the wayside are those that God has not saved. God determines who is saved and who is not. And I'd agree with you. I'm a Reformed pastor after all. God is absolutely sovereign. But it gives no excuse for our laziness. And Jesus understands that. So let's take a look at how Jesus interprets this paradox. He says in verse 38, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Very clearly, God is the Lord of the harvest. It is his field. It is his harvest. It is his will which sends out laborers, and yet Jesus Christ is commanding his disciples to do what? To pray earnestly to this Lord to send out laborers. Absolutely, God saves those whom he chooses, but absolutely, he uses us to do so. So here Jesus is commanding his disciples after having evaluated the current state of the missions market to beg, to plead, to ask, to beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers. So for those of us who are Christians who believe that we are the followers of Jesus Christ, what we should be doing then when we see the need all around us, we should be falling upon our knees to plead with a sovereign God to intervene in our hearts, to move us out of our comfort zone, to do what Jesus started. Let me say that again. When we see the need of the mission market around us, it should force us upon our knees to plead with the sovereign God to intervene in our hearts to move us out of our comfort zone to do what Jesus Christ started. At this point, you might turn around and say, wait, wait a minute, how did we go from asking God to send to asking God to be sent? There's a clear difference. I think, Pastor Mike, you have mixed up the object and the subject. Before you were saying, and Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to beg God to send more workers. I think you've got it mixed up. Why are you now telling us that what we ought to do is to beg God to send us? In order to understand this, let's look ahead to chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus Christ, after telling his disciples that what they ought to do is to plead and beg with the Lord of Harvest to send out more workers, what does he do immediately after? He gathers his disciples to him, and then what does he do? He sends them out. Did you catch that? that immediately after telling his disciples, after they have evaluated the missions market and seen such great need, that what they ought to do is spend time in prayer, begging and pleading God to send more workers out. What does Jesus immediately do? He calls his disciples to himself and then does what? Sends them out. Because the same disciples who saw the condition of the missions market, if they are truly followers of Jesus, would respond 
to that vision in the same way that Jesus responded. And how did he respond when he saw such a large crowd of people who were in need, who were like sheep without a shepherd? It drove him to compassion. And if we're truly the followers of Jesus Christ, it would drive us in the same way. Those of us who are going to Arizona will have an opportunity to truly see what this looks like. Uh, in Sells, Arizona, in the tribe of the Tahana Adam, there are four churches in the capital city of Sells. Four of those churches, out of the four of those churches, three of them currently do not have pastors. The one church, the Catholic church, does have a pastor there. There is a Assemblies of God church, there's a Baptist church, and there's a Presbyterian church. None currently with pastors. There is a large, enormous harvest waiting there. And God is asking us, Jesus is asking us, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I just came back from Haiti, um, where once again, there is such a great harvest. There is uh, so much need in this world of the gospel. And now some of you may turn around and say, well, you know, Pastor Mike, I can't handle the heat. Um, I don't speak Creole or, Sp or French. I don't speak Spanish. I don't speak German. I don't speak any other language but English and maybe a little bit of Korean. Pastor Mike, I don't like airplanes. I don't like to travel. Let me ask you a simple question then. As you look around the city of Lansdale, is there need? Is there need for the gospel? I know this part's not included in the, the PowerPoint, uh, but as Jesus left to go to heaven, he gave a final command to his disciples. It's called the Great Commission, found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. A lot of people mix up what that command is. The main command, the main uh, imperative given to us is make disciples. And people say go, they put the emphasis on the go. Well, actually, the way that that sentence is constructed is similar to the way that we talk about go and get me my pen. If I were to say to you, go and get me my pen, where do you go? Where my pen is. If I say go and get me a cup of water, where do you go? Where my water is. So when Jesus gives the command, go and make disciples, where do you go? Wherever you can make disciples. You don't have to go far. If in your own families you can make disciples, then that's where you ought to be. That's where you ought to do it. If in your own workplaces you can make disciples, then that's where you ought to be. If in your own schools you can make disciples, then that's where you ought to go. Let me leave you with a final appeal. John chapter four, verse 35, Jesus tells his disciples this. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I would make this same appeal for you. Lift up your eyes. See that the fields in front of you, the fields where you are, that they are white for harvest.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who reached out to us first. That while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of Christ, you sent your Son who died for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us on our own. You didn't wait for us to come to you. You came to us. Lord, I pray that when we look at the world around us that we are driven to compassion as you were, Lord. That we are driven to be first. That we are driven to be missional. That we are driven to go out. Lord, I pray, truly break our hearts for what breaks yours. I pray truly that when we look upon this world, we see not even just the suffering. The suffering is bad, bad enough on its own, Lord. Kids starving, it's bad enough on its own, Lord. Parentless, wandering. But Lord, we know the solution. Lord, we know the remedy. We have the cure. And yet we do nothing. Lord, drive us to our knees, Lord. Drive us to our knees to pray and then to go. Lord, may we truly understand the market condition of this world, Lord God, that there is such an incredible need for your gospel that the people of this world are dying without it. We have been given life and then given the task to preach that life, to offer it through the proclamation, the story of the death of your son. So Lord, I pray, make us desperate. Make us realize, Lord, the true state. Make us see the need all around us, Lord. Drive us to compassion. We thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's receive the benediction. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who looked upon this world, the broken and needy, and in compassion sent out his disciples. And the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be upon all of us here, both now and forevermore. Amen.